So I want to thank you all for joining us here today. We're going to have a, uh, a, a view of the landscape with a group of practitioners and activists that working on development issues. If there's one theme that has, has thread throughout this conference from uh, Dr. Kim at the World Bank, the sessions on finance, on innovation, on technology and science are all in terms of deploying and scaling up uh, processes and products uh, that are innovative in terms of solving global problems. What has happened though that really makes this an imperative and a, not only a generational challenge but a global challenge and the global goals that are, that are really part of it? Um, if we just uh, would pull up for a minute uh, slide number two. Um, we'll see that there is a major, as slide number two comes up, it'll show us that there is, oh, there we go, it doesn't show down here, interesting, okay. So we have, um, we have this, this inversion that occurred um, uh, three years ago was basically, has happened once before in, in economic history since the Industrial Revolution, when the new world surpassed the old world in terms of global GDP shares. So problems of underdeveloped economies, the developing economies, were, have always been key in the world. Um, and this, this has happened once before when the, the, the new world again surpassed the old world. Emerging in frontier markets and the developing countries really surpassed the development markets as demographic changes and other combination of other factors came. And whereas any, global inequality and problems of poverty and development have always been key in terms of solving them, now there's really no choice. The structural demands that we have upon the global economy in order to keep growth alive requires being able to motivate and activate uh, the productivity of populations in those countries in order to generate demand and returns that would meet the long tail liabilities and pension funds, health liabilities in the developed world, and uh, to, to, to take care of these aging populations and the demographic change that are underway. If we go to the next slide, you'll see it again, just in terms of the sheer inter interdependence that of, of global economic growth that is driven both by developed and emerging markets, but with an increasing share of the emerging and, and, de and developing markets in terms of where demand comes from, aggregate demand comes from, in order to uh, generate global growth. So these are very key changes that have occurred. And if we go to the next slide, on slide three, we just see that the, the importance of leapfrogging countries in terms of being able to accelerate development is increasingly key. Um, and we've had a laboratory of this in the case of Israel that we'll be talking about as a startup nation. And, uh, and, a, and a sort of Freudian misspelling of this at one, in one of our slides is also smart up nations, how we become climate smart, how we have smart uh, transportation and, and climate smart energy to, uh, to address these kinds of issues. So if we go on to the, to the uh, next slide, to slide four, uh, we can see this in terms of leapfrogging has been an exception and so many countries get caught in the lower to middle income uh, of, the, of the World Bank's areas and it was interesting this often quoted uh, Dr. Kim line about how important it was for him to spend 20 years in development and the last five years understanding finance. And, and why finance can become that motor of growth as we move to combining both the technical assistance and the assistance to countries with investment and trade so that we have customers in the developed world um, and generate that. If we go to jump to slide seven for a moment, we can see it just relative to the, uh, the, 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 the questions of looking at age structure, uh, how it works and what the demands are uh, as to whether or not the younger age structures of populations are democratic demographic dividend in terms of generating uh, 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 levels of growth or if it's a demographic bomb that will blow up on us. And that's really the questions of global stability that have to be answered in a geopolitical sense as well. And then if we go to slide eight, we have two uh, basic factors, two big financing gaps. One is meeting the needs of climate change and, and adaptation and adjustment uh, that were discussed in Paris and in Marrakesh uh, this last fall. And there's a, a, a serious uh, uh, gap there, you know, around $5.7 trillion annually. So that's a challenge. And if we go to the next slide, the other side of that coin are the sustainable development goals that were uh, declared at the UN in 2015 and are roughly around a $3 trillion gap. But it's not that, it's, this is the, there's every reason to be optimistic that that gap can be solved if we go on um, uh, to the source, to slide 10, where the sources of capital that are going to come from, uh, we have the lowest yielding, the, the, the yield gap's very lower, the sources of capital for uh, developed for long-term development finance are cheaper than they've been historically. Um, if we go to the next slide, 
after that, we can see it, and this is a very key slide, look at the fixed income market, is that we have somewhere between eight to 14 trillion dollars of negative yields in the, in, the, in the bond markets of the world, in the fixed income market. So if we can come up with bankable projects, so with investable projects in the developing world, couple and co-innovate our way out of this problem, we can, we can keep growth alive. So the conditions are actually, so if we can start to, to show through blended finance has been a subject here, the ways of matching together public and private and philanthropic sources and impact investing and other sorts of movements to activate all of the asset classes so that we can bridge that gap. If we go again to um, slide uh, 13, just to set up our problem here, these major challenges of developing countries are in these areas of food security, of clean water and sanitation, of energy and light, and of health care, and this very famous energy and food water nexus that's been talked about here in many of the panels at the conference when we talk about trying to feed the future uh, as we move up to 9 billion uh, people by 2050 and, uh, and, and have to produce 60 more percent of 60% uh, growth in food production. We'll be hearing more about that from Secretary Ross and how to do that in a way that's, that's climate smart. And, uh, and go to the next slide. Uh, why? Do we have the experiences? I also am uh, most of my year as senior director of the Milken Innovation Center at the Jerusalem Institute. And if we click that slide again to pull up the, uh, the challenges that over the last 69 years in Israel have been to meet the problems of land scarcity, water scarcity, and it's the classic economic problem. How do we overcome scarcity in these areas and climate adversity and, and, and rural development? And click it one more time here. And actually we required niche expertise in these areas. Uh, both in food, water, energy, and health, but also in terms of security of systems of delivery, whether it be energy or water and, and cyber security, in order to sustain uh, the, the security of the delivery of those systems in healthcare, electronic health records, and so forth, in order to deal with infectious disease and chronic diseases in, in, in all of these places. And if we go just to slide um, uh, uh, 16 uh, for a moment, um, and uh, the way we do that is by the financial innovations labs we do and fellows and projects. And since the prime minister and the governor, of Cal Governor Brown, signed an agreement uh, three years ago on uh, this memorandum of understanding, we've been holding a series of our financial innovations labs in Jerusalem. We used to do them here the day after the conference. We're doing them more in Israel now. And uh, if we go to, to uh, slide 30, uh, You'll be able to see this was uh, Secretary Ross and, 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 and the, the chairman of the, of the California Food and Ag Board um, and Dr. Oradar from the Israel Innovation Authority looking at ways that we can accelerate uh, that in, in slide 37. A similar lab was done in, in 2015 on water on trying to build sustainable water and sustainable water financing to, to deal with the drought issues uh, here in California. And just a month ago, uh, we were with all the growers up at UC Davis, again with Secretary Ross, looking at mechanisms of extending and launching and accelerating technology transfer and how to finance that by trying to monetize the, the avoided cost of, of water loss and, and, and more energy efficient ways of doing that. And then more, most recently, slide 42, um, are the questions of, of, uh, of the R&D that are related to this, and also in March we had the, the head of the, um, of the Israel Innovation Authority and the Chief Innovation Officer of the University of California Office of the President, all the national labs up at Berkeley and from other campuses sign an agreement to focus on R&D on these global goals, on this match between climate change and, 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 and sustainable development goals. So how do we scale up now if we look at slide 24? Um, uh, we're looking at a way, and, and click that one more time, of building partnerships between Israel and California with the Blum Center that we'll be hearing about with the various labs that we're doing, and click that one more time if you could. And other t that's been building the circle of, of, of innovation more broadly also with the Ministry of Economy and uh, the water districts. We had 30 companies here. Um, uh, water companies last uh, summer that have launched, uh, met with 300 water districts that have launched, launched 80 water projects uh, from farms and water districts in California uh, to aggregate those technologies and deployment will be, if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, we'll be launching, uh, announcing here today, a Masters of Development pro uh, Practice program between the business school and the ag faculty and engineering uh, in Rehovot. And there, 
these, these development practice programs grew out of a MacArthur Foundation initiative. There hasn't been one in our neighborhood, as you can see there. And go to the next uh, slide. And that will be start to build this, uh, this coalition between Hebrew University, University of California broadly, and, and, and the Milken Innovation Center and the Jerusalem Institute to launch teams of students as, as they've been launched in part by the Blum Center and in part at the university. And go to the next slide. Just to give you an idea, and this is the way the structure of our program will be bringing people from developing countries to Israel to work for two years, study and work on, and, and go home and work on, on project implementation. Uh, and go to slide 27. We may have hit it. And I think that's about all that I wanted to do in terms of introducing this today. And maybe we will just start off by asking. Uh, our, our three uh, government representatives here today to, to describe the scope of the problem, how to activate, and I'd like to start with Clara Akamanzi, who was fortunate enough to visit her country as some of the work we were doing uh, through the Milken Institute with the Capital Markets Authority in Rwanda, uh, through our Center for Financial Markets, and with the uh, Capital Markets of Tanzania, aside from just being also kind of like Israel, punching above their weight as a small country that's had a lot of problems in the past, but is, is, devel is developing out of them. Claire's position is the CEO, CEO of the Rwanda Development Board and, and the cabinet of President Kagame, who had been with us here at the conference uh, in the past, and very excited about the leadership and the convening that they have been done in the programs they're launching. But what, how do you see that we can move through these sets of problems mm -hmm. now? Um, thank you very much, uh, Glenn. Uh, one of the, the problems that uh, Glenn highlighted was uh, healthcare uh, among the challenges developing countries face. And uh, on Monday this week, um, the president of the World Bank, Jim Yong Kim, did uh, give an example of how Rwanda had uh, taken advantage of an innovation to solve a healthcare, healthcare problem. He talked about a drone uh, project that we have in Rwanda in partnership with a private uh, startup company from San, Fran San Francisco that uses drones to deliver blood uh, when blood is needed in hospitals, which is a very good innovation on our part. Uh, Rwanda is a very hilly country. To drive from one place to another, you have to go through so many hills. And transportation um, is, is not an easy uh, challenge to overcome. So drones being able to deliver blood, which a lot of times is needed as an emergency, was a, a very welcome uh, innovation. But apart from that, let me give you three other examples of some innovations we've seen in the country that have helped to solve uh, uh, problems. One of them is a, a partnership between government and a private American university called the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, as you know, to spur um, economic growth uh, using innovation, countries need the skills that um, should be available in the country. And so we did a PPP uh, with Carnegie Mellon University to encourage them to come and set up a university in Rwanda, uh, which they did, and which they're setting up to teach Rwandans and other African students uh, you know, the kind of degrees they give here in Pittsburgh in computer science and engineering. And so, but for that to happen, it had to be a, a government to take some of the risk um, and to take, give some of the incentives for Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon to come to the country. Now, another example I want to give is um, uh, something called Rwanda Online, which is a private company um, supported by government in partnership with a Singaporean company called um, Crimson Logic that is putting all services that government gives citizens on uh, an online platform. And so that includes registration of businesses, uh, transfer of land, registration of land, and that builds on a system that we put in place to, you know, to create uh, the digitization and registration of land in the, almost the whole country because that didn't happen before. And that was very crucial because uh, land was very informally used uh, for agriculture, but then when you s begin to register land in the country and put it online, uh, you make it very easy for everyone, including farmers, to use their land uh, as collateral to borrow money from the bank. And that has actually very much uh, uh, increased credit being given by banks to agriculture and to other areas because land can be used um, as, a, as a collateral. And that was only because it was able to, we were able to register it, put it online, and then link the land registry with the mortgage registry in the banks and the company registry. And that, you know, uh, Rwanda online innovation has been very helpful to actually solve that problem of uh, land being able, you know, to, to support economic growth. The other example that I want to give, to give is, um, again, another local company called Pivot Access, an IT company that solves problems that are very peculiar to Rwanda and other developing countries. Um, they, they developed a mobile application that you can use to pay for electricity. Um, in, we pay for electricity in Rwanda through a prepaid process because it's very difficult to collect bills you know, in a country like Rwanda. One, 
you know, the, 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 the infrastructure to send bills through post office and then get it paid through the banking system is not as developed as you'd have in the US. And so a prepaid solution is what would work in terms of buying your electricity. And then because almost everyone has a mobile phone, uh, being able to make it easy for anyone in the country to buy electricity through the mobile phone was something that was very, um, very helpful that this local company was able to develop in the country. So with those examples, the question that we ask ourselves as policymakers, as government is, um, how can we have tens and hundreds and thousands of such solutions to solve practical problems that a country like Rwanda has? And, um, and so we came up with this idea of uh, Kigali Innovation City, which is a new project and who, whose aim is to really uh, catalyze more innovations, such as the ones that I've given examples of, so we can have a lot more of these happening within the country and maybe even exporting outside the country. Kigali Innovation City is going to uh, address or you know, be hinged on four pillars. One is to provide a geographical location uh, with well-developed real estate that can support co-creation, can support a sense of community, kind of a sense of expression among those that use it. And that's going to include um, young entrepreneurs, government uh, regulatory bodies, uh, startup companies, innovation labs, uh, and global companies that want to come and set up in Rwanda so that we can give them one geographical place where they can actually learn from each other and develop each other to see more innovation coming across. The second one is human capital. By locating um, within that geographical location, we have Carnegie Mellon that I talked about. We have the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. We have uh, an Institute of Physics that is looking at developing research uh, in mathematics as well as physics, again, within that same location as a way of uh, supporting people to access knowledge and build their skills at the same time. The third one is uh, also attracting global companies. You, we have, uh, for example, Cisco and Ericsson that we're working with to bring their solutions from all over the world, set up um, in Rwanda, but also use the ecosystem that they'll find available to customize some of their solutions to solving problems that are very, very particular to, to Rwanda and to other developing countries, which is not always the same as other parts of the world. And the last component of the Kigali Innovation City is also solving a problem of access to funding. Uh, a lot of our young ent entrepreneurs will tell you that uh, it's very expensive to get a loan to take the idea to market. Uh, our loans are about 16, 17, 18, sometimes even above 18%, which is very prohibitive. So how do you create a system where you also bring other types of funding, especially venture capital? And I know that uh, one of the, the, the panelists, um, Angela, will probably talk about some of the ideas they have working with the government to bring an innovation fund to support ideas. So this is what we're doing, to, and hopefully the, the, the end result that we want to see is a uh, solutions that solve particular problems, whether it's in healthcare, agriculture, or climate change, or whatever it is, but something that is very customized and practical for Rwanda. Great. Let's just certainly see the way that these partnerships are evolving. How, how, does, how is it seen in terms of looking at, at the connection with Africa? Uh, oftentimes, we, we've talked in our sessions about Africa being the next China, in terms of a driver where 90% of the population growth of the world is going to be in Africa by mid-century. Um, uh, how, do, how's, how does Israel look at the Africa-Israel innovation <coughs> development? Well, first of all, let me just say that it's a thrill to share the uh, panel with government officials from California and from Africa because uh, the state of Israel is doing a lot and attempting to do a lot more uh, with both, uh, with both uh, states and, or states, continents, etc. Mm -hmm. We're uh, looking to do a lot in Africa, but basically what we're do looking to do is uh, apply technologies uh, that we've been able to develop uh, distinctive skills at and help the African uh, nations solve their problems. Mm -hmm. We find that when you talk about, I think the title of this uh, session is scaling, etc. The easiest way to scale is via technology. And what we've done is we've worked on a number of areas which address many of the problems that uh, that we've been referring to, talking about cybersecurity, talking about autonomous vehicles, which, by the way, reduces pollution tremendously on the, on the roads, et cetera, talking about digital health. And we're doing a number of uh, initiatives on those fronts in order to help uh, not only Israel solve its challenges, but also to take those uh, solutions and scale them up all over the world, including, obviously, in Africa. What, as we've worked uh, through some of the problems even within Israel on, on, on fuel choices, on, uh, on issues of water, on, on health in terms of the acceleration of the life sciences industry, I mean, we've been very honored to work with the 
with the Prime Minister. Some of our fellows are here on a two-week field trip on the California-Israel Innovation They didn't MOU. have those when I was in school. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they've been working at the Ministry of Environmental Protection and, and Energy on, on, on solar. Could you describe a little bit the process of how, how the government innovates as an investor, as an active investor in these programs? Well, I'll say the government, you know, there's a lot of things you have to be very skeptical about with government anywhere, right? When do you know when someone's lying? I'm from the government, I'm here to help. So we're very, very, we're very, very cautious about those things, but we're entering a world. That's the way California feels, Washington. <laughs> but then it gets, no, go ahead. No, but seriously, <laughs> we're entering a world in which, uh, whether we like it or not, it's becoming increasingly interconnected, and uh, that connectivity and <laughs> that big data and put on top of that artificial intelligence, and you have all sorts of opportunities, but all sorts of exposures. What we've decided to do in Israel is uh, develop a lot of, a number of private-public partnerships to focus on areas in that space. So we look at connectivity, we look at big data, we look at artificial intelligence, we see, okay, these are things that we're pretty good at. Uh, the world is telling us, the market is telling us that we we're very good at it. As a country, or as a government, what we can do is create the right tax incentives, create the right overall financial incentives, and create opportunities for the private sector to do what it does best. And that's why a lot of what we're doing uh, with California, with Africa, and with countries around the world are a series of private-public partnerships where we're trying to help make the world a better place and address the problems that have been talked about uh, so, uh, so interestingly at this conference. Let's pull up slide 32, because I'd like to turn the next question to Secretary Ross, who's been a, a, a pioneer uh, on, uh, if we pull this up, it was one of the points of discussion we had at our lab back in June in Jerusalem. And the way it's seen in California and coming up with climate smart innovations in agriculture, ways of decoupling resource use to an increased productivity simultaneously as we decoupled water use from ag productivity. Um, uh, in Israel and in, in other types of cases, and the link between uh, energy and water and food. How do, you, how do you see us framing this issue as, as you go forward in the programs and policies and financial products to develop them? Well, for me, everything starts with water. <laughs> and I think water is the, the issue of the 21st century. It's, it's scarcity. And so for us um, at the Department of Food and Agriculture, because we've just come out of this drought, um, and suffering the way that our rural communities did during the drought was as good as we've been at adopting technology. Um, there's more that can be done, and the best way to learn that is, is to have partnerships with other countries to see what they're doing on the ground. And so under or on the platform of Climate Smart Agriculture, we've been able to do those kinds of partnerships. I took a delegation to Israel last year, and it was, it was an eye-opening experience. I would say that there was a revolution that started in 1965 when Netafim on a kibbutz in Israel um, brought all of us drip irrigation. Now that was a technology that a USDA employee had come up with, but it had never been deployed. And it was nothing then compared to what it is today. And on a global basis, there's still much more to do. And my friend, the Chief Sustainability Officer from Netafim knows that. But if you start with water, which is necessary for life and nothing can grow without it, and you really look at what Israel has done, it is a great partner from Cali for California because we know what has happened on our shortage of surface supply. We know we have a groundwater supply that other nations don't have. But really understanding, A, how we can more precisely use that water at exactly the right time and at exactly the right places and all the technologies that go along with that. Mm -hmm. and. The real next generation is the deployment of recycled water and the ability to better match the origin of the water to more appropriately match its end use. We learned a little bit of that in Australia when we were there, but nothing like what Israel can show us on that. What we find in deploying technology on the farm, and I can't talk about the whole food chain, but on the farm for us, I think is the same with farmers here as it is around the world, and that is um, especially during the drought, we had so many companies coming to us with, look at my solution. Mm -hmm. And they had never spent the time with a farmer to understand the real world practicalities, of what the challenges are for that place, mm -hmm. let alone a place on another continent with a different set of issues that are very specific to the locale. It is the importance of being able to spend time with a farmer and time with some sort of academic 
element to it. And I think that's been a real key for both of us. For us, it has been cooperative extension. A company working with a farmer who will give some land for a trial that will have a scientist collecting the data and analyzing that is the fastest way of bringing other farmers in to really scale up that technology, whether it's by a neighborhood or by a whole country. So having a public-private partnership for us is the private sector, a company like Netafim, who's done this very, very successfully, having a university cooperative extension partner, as well as government with a policy direction to also set the right signal. And setting the policy for us in California um, has been a very important part of just beginning to do a partnership that I know is going to yield tremendous results. Um, when we look at, at the issues of feeding this population, um, Finance is important, but if they, if they don't have food, if they can't feed their families, we have really foundational problems that will be difficult to surpass. Ellie, you wanted to? I, I would just on. add one thing, just to give sort of the, the framework around the water challenges and what's, what's possible to do. When the state of Israel was established 69 years ago this week, our population was a 15th of what we are today. Our GDP per capita was a tenth of what it is today. and um, overall rainfall was about double what it is today. So think about the terms of consumption. The population has grown by a factor of 15. The consumption of that population has grown by a factor of 10. So you want to combine those two factors together. Rainfall has dropped by 50%, and we went from having a, um, a drought to a surplus. So that's what can be done with um, water management, water recycling, and the, exactly the things we were discussing yes. there. And that's why I have no doubt uh, that California uh, will be able to, to, yes. to stand up to its challenges because it's possible, it can be done, it has been done, but it takes real focus. It, it takes focus and investment, but I have to say climate also shows us the multiple benefits that come from. We focus on water, but precise use of water reduces energy use. Precise use of water improves and can lower fertilizer use. It lowers other inputs, and it, and it can increase yields. So it is more than a triple bottom line whammy win. Right. The, well, the only thing I would add to that is, if you think about one of your earlier slides, Glenn, you talked about the $3 billion, uh, three, was it the $3 trillion gap? Right. Um, what Karen is saying basically is saying that you can close that gap not just by finding extra financing, but by reducing uh, the requirements because yes. you're going to use less fertilizer, et cetera. And that's really where and the biggest opportunity is. And your productivity increase, productivity led increases. You know, it's, we find that the growth in, that's generated by agriculture is up to four times more effective at reducing poverty globally than yeah. in any other sector and being able to diversify crops and and the same is true for autonomous vehicles and cyber. They're exactly. all interconnected to other things. Those, those are, are real accelerators that, we, uh, that, that we're going to need in order to overcome the sort of tepid global growth that Absolutely. Uh, we're looking at right now. Well, maybe at this point we could, we could uh, shift a, a little bit to just also the, uh, uh, the personal story of, of, of Richard Blum. Uh, both in his professional career uh, and uh, his professional career uh, both uh, in, in finance but, and, and, in, and in public service at the University of California and building the Blum Centers for, for, uh, for Developing Economies. Um, if we could uh, shift over to, let's see, slide. Um, take us back a little bit in time. Slide number 50 and uh, pull up slide 50, please. Um, and this is, is the theme of some, some, some thoughts and ideas, and I would recommend everybody, if the book is still at the bookstore, uh, might have been sold out by now, if you go to uh, slide 51, An Accident of Geography, this book that, uh, that talks about your personal uh, journey, Richard. How did, how did you go from being a, a trekker and a mountain climber to uh, focusing on, on these challenges of developing economies? Well, I did that at the same time becoming a private equity junkie. So, and, and we were one of the first people to uh, invest in Asia um, 30 years ago, and they thought we didn't know what we were doing. And it was, that, it was a bet on the growth of the middle class, particularly in North Asia, uh, Northeast Asia, and mainly Korea and China. And interesting, we haven't talked about China, but one of the reasons China is where it is is because the kind of innovation uh, that they are doing, um, they're smarter than we are in a lot of these things now. So I hope um, we're doing some of this with our center at Berkeley. Um, in fact, we have, we're trying to help a 
new university in uh, Pudong, which is in Shanghai, uh, technical engineering, and it uh, get up and going. And I went to a meeting, and there were 10 people in the meeting, both from Berkeley and from Shanghai, only I couldn't too tell who was from where because they were all Chinese. <laughs> and um, so I hope, and what you're doing in Israel, that you, you, I, you, you have links with China, and I can just encourage you to grow them. Oh, uh, we've been working on that in, in the, in the China-Israel <laughs> trade agreement, and uh, we realized that together we're 1.3 billion people. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, the interesting thing is the bet on the middle class in China is worn out because I ask you how many, if $40,000 in China gets you in the middle class, how many people do you think there are in the middle class in China today? Anybody got a guess? 320 million people make $40,000 a year or more. Um, but in any event, to, to, to get back to where we started, um, I'd always been fascinated as a little boy in the Himalayas. And Pull up I, slide 52 as Richard's talking, please. Go ahead. Uh, and, and so I first went there, I, I, it's 49 years ago, just now. And uh, I went there as a trekker, as a climber, and, um, and uh, started uh, working with Sir Edmund Hillary. By the way, this is the ultimate non-tech stuff. You know, um, how do you help development in these villages? Go to the villages and talk to the villagers. So this was about ha hammering nails and putting, keeping schools from falling apart or building them. And uh, here's the guy who first climbed Everest. In some ways, he was one of the best people in terms of um, getting past governments which you often want to do, particularly in a place like Nepal. Um, Pull up slide and, 53, please. And um, because village, villagers are smarter than you think you are. They, maybe they, they're not going to get your PhD or come up with your next innovation in, in either uh, Jerusalem or Berkeley. Uh, but it, why go through all this? Don't forget to talk to the villagers because you can learn a lot from them. And then one of the things that you talked about is the most important. To the extent that you can have people own land, and one of the first people to try to get this done in, in a comprehensive way was, is in Peru. Uh, when you have a title to land, then you have collateral. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you can borrow and expand your agriculture uh, endeavors or, or going to something else. And so I, I think uh, in Rwanda, you're really doing the right thing. But to get back to this, so um, uh, one thing led to another, and we started something called the American Himalayan Foundation when six scruffy guys came off of Mount Everest in 1981 and said, let's do something. And today, the American Himalayan Foundation touches 350,000 lives. We started with Sherpas, then the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan refugees, and our biggest program today is saving young girls from being sold into prostitution. And we keep them in school, we have 14,000 of them. And how do you keep them in school and how do you, these are mainly low caste Hindus and um, let their families believe that these girls are assets, not liabilities. It's teaching them trades, it's teaching, and increasingly it's less about, you know, social services and more about innovation um, in, in a place even as poor as Nepal is. Um, that led to my starting the Center for Developing Economies uh, at Berkeley, uh, and we're now- Pull up slide 54, please. That's Berkeley. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and 55. Right. Next slide. Uh, but, but to get back to, the, uh, I'd, I'd been in, had been involved in the business school since I went there, and people thought when I started the center that I'd probably want the business school to be our primary partner. No, it was the School of Engineering because 
the way you really bring, bring people out of poverty is through innovation. So uh, working with, with the School of Engineering at Berkeley, um, increasingly uh, the project with um, Jerusalem uh, and elsewhere um, is, is, is changing the way uh, not only places like Rwanda thinks, places like Berkeley think, because we started something called the, 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 the um, New Ideas Program, or the Big Ideas Program, where all the students would submit. How many of them were submitted? Oh, uh, gosh, uh, close to 300. I think more than that. Yeah. But in any event, uh, it's kids with ideas on how to start up a business. And I thought it was kind of hokey. I didn't think we'd get anything out of it. It's been going six, seven years now. And there's a number of interesting businesses that- 56, kids, please. Kids 56. at Berkeley. And if you go to our center, you, you, you go downstairs, um, there's a bunch of kids working in the back rooms on, uh, on just new ideas. <laughs> and it's changing the world. And we're now at um, nine of the 10 UC campuses. And our, our newest first campus abroad Finally, we've been back and forth with them for some time. Is going to be Jerusalem, and I think a, a lot can can come out of that. So, um, I've kind of been around it all, from climbing mountains to being a private equity investor, and we've done well over there, to um, e expanding um, what what our centers are <coughs> doing throughout the UC system. And they, they, there's a link between them, but they all do a little something different. Um, the fellow who runs our uh, UCLA center, Michael Rodriguez, uh, is here. And, and Michael, where are you? Right there. At any rate, um, what we're doing out of the UCLA center is really all about healthcare in Latin America. And um, so, I, I, but my biggest problem is what's going on now in Washington. Uh, we only spend $19 billion on foreign assistance. That's the aid budget. 19 billion is, people think we spend a lot of money on foreign aid, we don't. It's one third of 1% of a $4 trillion budget. And the, the current administration wants to cut that budget by a third. Now, thanks to a continuing resolution, uh, they may not be able to cut it at all or cut it very little. But there's no, uh, you know, there's no question that the current administration wants to shrink the State Department, wants to shrink uh, these kind of programs. They don't call, fall under the category of make America great again. I argue that they do because if you're trying to win hearts and minds and bring economic prosperity to countries in Africa and Latin America and certain places in Asia. Do you want them to follow our model, a democratic model, or do you want them to follow the Chinese model? I mean, that's kind of the big battle going on. Hopefully in a lot of places, we and China can work together, but mainly we don't. And uh, so, um, I. What's morphed out of uh, going around and on television and giving lectures about my book is what do you do about foreign assistance? Not just keeping it where it is, how do you expand it? Well, you're not going to probably get a lot of money out of uh, the U.S. government to do this. So increasingly it's going to be private sector or private sector government joint ventures. What should we be doing and, and, and how do we fund these projects? Because as the slides show, uh, the, the de developing markets are a bigger percentage of markets worldwide than they were years ago. So it's not only in the interest of people that need help in these countries, it's in our own interest. Because um, whatever you want to say about imports from China to the United States, look at what a huge trading partner China has become. Look what a huge trading partner Mexico has become, as well as Canada. So we, we just uh, pulled up on slide 20 and uh, slide 57, I think, is here. Um, 
just on the, the, the force multiplier is really the students that we can deploy, and there are professionals that'll start to solve these, these problems. Let's just move can on. Can I say one thing sure. about the students before we forget? One of the reasons this works is in order to get, even though we've had 14,000 kids through our classes just at Berkeley alone, uh, we give out a minor degree, not a major. And because if you said to me when I went to school, do you want a major in business or do you want a major in global poverty? I would have said I want a major in business. But if you could major global in engineering or, or business and have a minor in global poverty, you'd do that. But in order to complete your degree, you have to go do a, an approved project somewhere for a few months. We have already worked in 80 plus countries. So we can just do that at Berkeley alone plus the other things we're talking about, that be in Israel or Kathmandu, um, what you find is young people want to do it. Um, we have a granddaughter who I had working in a, an orthopedic hospital in, in Kathmandu, uh, is now going to um, Harvard in the fall to get a degree in global health. Mm -hmm. And in the end of the day, if you look at all this stuff, you got to start with food. You got to feed people, and then then it's health. And you heard many of you heard uh, President Bush talk about what he's done with mm -hmm. PetFar, which was really been good. Um, and then you can do the rest. Let me let me give, give you kind of a quick example of what we learned in the California Israel Innovation Project. In slide 28, we had these fellows come over from Berkeley and from San Diego. Uh, and they worked in the field and, 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 and uh, uh, also with the, the, the Haas Institute on Energy. Uh, and they were in the field in the Negev there at Wadi Atir that we talked about this morning. Um, and then they, uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, one of the fellows was working on a two-part project and off, doing off-grid in Burundi. And these things are so key, as, as Karen was pointing out. I mean, water quality and water supply are so key. Uh, because 58% of all the hospital beds are full of people that have water-carried diseases. So we solved the water quality and distribution and distributed distribution, which again, we've got some great Israeli technology on distributed uh, energy and distributed water production. And, and here, this was from Valley still open. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, 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 and in this case, it was putting uh, uh, street lining through mini grids, uh, through uh, micro grids uh, in, in Burundi, and that cuts down on rapes and the propagation of AIDS. So, so an amazing sort of thing, once you get security, you know, by, by, uh, by street lining, it makes a di big difference in what goes on. And then if you just jump to a sort of highfalutin uh, financial idea in slide 36, one of the things we've been talking about with the University of California Office of the Presidents and the Regents Funds and some others, and the Israel Innovation Fund, the, one of the Indian fellows in that uh, from, from San Diego who had been with us last summer, spent time at the Israel Innovation Authority, basically tracking the IP that was in technology transfers in Israel that we could put together in a research-backed obligation bond, uh, based obligation bond, which would be a long-term security, fixed end some security that would commercialize and, and monetize uh, that IP. But let's just go back to projects and, and, and businesses and enterprises, and I want to shift it to the question to Angela Hamsi, who has been a bond trader and, and, a, and, a, and a, um, a, a, it worked at, at larger portfolio investment firms and now an in impact investment. Tell us about your transition uh, to impact investment and the Aganza Innovation, Africa Innovation Fund. Sure. Um, there's one thing I want to, to highlight like we've heard today. First, it's a very good news that we have here. What we heard from all our panelists is basically everybody sort of agree that innovation is one of the key solutions to solve sustainable economic development and leapfrog, which is, was not the case not that long ago, but now everybody agrees with that. We also agreed, I think, that um, technology is not really the problem anymore. We know how to purif purify water. We know uh, how to bring like, clean energy to people. We know how to do all these things. Like, we, we really like, got a long way to understand how to do these things. When everyone uh, agrees, I get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we, also, we also, I think, um, know that the, the amount of capital is not so much the problem. There's lots of capital sitting out there getting ready to be invested. Um, and the demand is not a problem. Your slide on the GNI is, you know, is mm -hmm. really mind-blowing that now emerging market demand is, is stronger. And so I think this is all great. So with all these good things together, why haven't we yet solved this SDGs? 
Why haven't we yet got to sustainable this development goals? Sustainable development goals. Why or global goals? They're now. Yeah. Why haven't we yet got like to even like a fraction of the five billion people that are in need of all these different solutions and that really are like very close by? And so basically, what what I'm saying there, and that's how I move from the financial sort of um, you know from mindset to really an implementation mindset as well, is how do we make all this innovation? get to everyone and everywhere, how we make it them deep in the field. And, and for that, we need to basically move from the lab to the farm to all the tables of the people and to be able to reach out very far. And it's really getting to what we call like applied innovation and to understand how to unlock applied innovation. And, and that's only by doing that and then you get great businesses that achieve scale uh, and that can really basically like both scale their impact and scale their business model and be investable by all the big investors out there that are getting ready to deploy capital. So it's really a failure of pipeline and investable solution that rich scale that we have and that we need to solve for for investments and business to to work well in this region. And, I, and, and to summarize really what I see as one of the big solutions for that, it, it's really like there's three A's to solving for applied innovation. It's affordability, like real affordability of the solution we're building. It's accessibility because you know in, in Africa or in China or in other emerging market, vast majority of the population that needs those solutions are in very deep rural area. Um, and the third one is about like, you know, really creating business model that provide added values to all the stakeholder and stakeholder by being financial stakeholder or being uh, local people. Um, and, and for that, we mentioned it a few times on the panel, there's quite a common thread that solves for all three dimensions. And this is this concept of PPPs that we've mentioned, private public partnerships. For affordability, we've seen looking at a lot of different areas from access to energy, to agriculture, clean water, etc that in order to achieve deep affordability to the end users, you need scale in the country. You need to have a top-down approach that looks at the problem really in a coordinated and planified way before you go and spend your capital and, and, and implement. You need to have scale contracting that you can only do by engaging with the government and with the local stakeholder. And you need as well to engage with these different local partners and, and public partners because you need to reduce your cost of capital for investors to come in in a way that it makes the risk reward really interesting. And by mitigating their risk. With by mitigating the there. risk and by, by simply having alignment of interest. Because if you have alignment in interest when you create these businesses with the local important players that the governments are, it means that you reduce the cost of capital, which means that you reduce the cost to the end client. You pass through all the savings, and then they can be really affordable by the market and by all these people that are living um, under just a few dollars a day. Um, so that's something very important. The second point I mentioned is accessibility. So how do we make sure that all these great, beautiful technologies are reaching this guy that is living like five hours you know, from like any closed city, from any city out there. It's hard to access you know, infrastructure. The roads are not great. I mean, there are drones, but it's not for everything. Mm -hmm. That's very important. But we need to reach all these people and provide them what they need in a way that makes sense for the, for the businesses to do it. And for doing that, again, um, one thing that's important after the top-down approach is really having a strong bottom-up execution. You need to have people on the ground. You need to work with local player and stakeholder. You need to work with them not only because they're there on the ground, but because they know their countries better than you do. So they know how to navigate this like challenging ecosystem, sometimes know how to go deep. And you really need to engage. And this is really core to everything that we do, is really engaging like that locally. And as well for the innovation mindset, you need to have um, innovation that comes as well from the ground up. So it's great to create beautiful products in Silicon Valley in Israel, and the knowledge that we've been able to accumulate in this innovation, these, these two amazing innovation hub that we have, and we have presents like both in the US and in Israel in, in our company, um, you, it needs to be complemented by really working together with people on the ground to create like country fits innovation. It's not about creating a great product and like you're tweaking a bit, you maybe made the cost a bit lower, you put like a cheaper plastic around it and then you can ship it to poorer people and adjust it. It doesn't work. So you really have to co-innovate together. And this is something that is important in everything that we do again, co-innovation from the ground up, working with all the knowledge we have here and with all the knowledge that they have there and bring it together as a team. Uh, the last point I would say that is very important, and that's really what unlock the trillions of capitals that we need to go to go into these sectors, is this added value, shared added value for all the different stakeholders. In terms of the financial stakeholder, here the PPP again is an important part because you have to have the right 
um, allocations of risk and of reward so that it really becomes project that can unlock institutional capital. Impact investor is a field I've been in for like 15 years. Um, but sometimes it has almost, like the concept of impact has been misunderstood for being okay to almost like uh, mediocrity for doing good. Mm -hmm. Well, if we want to unlock institutional capital, if you want to unlock the real money out there that is needed, you can't do that. You we need to, to mainstream be, these investments. You need to mainstream that. You need to be as competitive of any other investor that people want to make. And they need to be basically done by a way where each, each stakeholder will take the right piece of the puzzle and, and, and like bring um, right structuring and the right, um, the right uh, investable proposition to this institutional capital provider. And, and again, like, you know, added value for all stakeholders, you need to go local. It's local, local, local. That means like you, you, uh, we give power to the people in the rural area, but we have to empower them as much as you give them power. You need to like, bring them up to speed like, and train people, empower them to become their, their own managers, their own um, uh, head of the, uh, of the companies, and to really grow there um, uh, together with the business and create like, great entrepreneurs, great management teams, and work with them locally. And so Ignite is the company Ignite Power, um, the company doing that, uh, that we're doing that with, which basically is working between Israel, have a strong Israeli content and presence, together with American partners. I was actually incubated at Milken here quite a few years ago with people that met at Milken together. That is working in Africa as being like a solution provider and a developer and financing uh, arm for this uh, real needs-based innovative solution from um, access to clean energy to the rural areas to agriculture technology solutions, working with Netafim and others, and basically doing all these things uh, in the way that we achieve those three A's. And the Angeza Fund, which you mentioned. What does Angeza mean? In, to, in to, it's a Swahili word, actually, to mean like to shed light. Shed light. Um, and basically, uh, there we, we're replicating also that the model. Also, the slogan of the of University of California, let there be light, which also comes from another <laughs> text go. we all know. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, by doing much. that, by doing that, like we want to replicate the model and scale it up, um, and working on that with Rwanda, actually, and the Rwandan government and other players to like make that uh, something even more scalable across sectors. Now, the other information gap or asymmetry is is both capital, but also information and the deployment of information. Uh, Jeremy Bentley is here with us from City and City Israel in, in Tel Aviv, and we've. Uh, been really honored to work very closely with them as a partner on financial inclusion technology that could be carve new channels in the non-bank sector uh, and in credit union ideas, other things that, that have just uh, been deregulated in Israel so, to make this possible. Uh, and also the establishment with, uh, with uh, the government as a partner, 40%, I believe, uh, into the, uh, the FinTech Center in Tel Aviv, which is launching lots of new products and, and ideas and processes. Uh, using as the, one of the titles of a session here from our Washington uh, Institute office was, uh, was on fin action. It's not just fin, fin tech, not financial tech, fintech, but how it, it gets activated and, and builds these markets out. How, does, how do you do that? Well, actually, perhaps I just want to, to say that cities have been in Israel for about 20 years, and uh, we are very happy to be an agent for change uh, to introduce innovation into the market. And I just want to pick up perhaps on the word, uh, I think, collaboration, which is very important, because we've been involved in another, a number of initiatives, uh, financial inclusion, as, as you mentioned, uh, Glenn, and we're very happy to be part of the uh, background work that's created change, and hopefully uh, we'll see the introduction of new banks into the market. But also in financial innovation, um, you know, a number of years ago, uh, City, uh, we already have a number of innovation centers around the world. So a number of years ago, um, the government of Israel actually was interested in turning Israel into a regional hub. Putting geopolitical issues aside, it was obvious that what was our relative advantage, and in fact, that's the name of the program, it was called then, uh, we're a tech company, a tech country, sorry. Um, at the same time, um, we were looking to develop an innovation center to support our uh, markets trading division. Um, we're a leading bank. We have a, a platform called FX Velocity, if anybody aware of it, which is perhaps one of the leading platforms in the world. A lot of it has been developed in Israel. Um, fortuitously, we were there at the same time <clears throat> when the government was looking to bring in international corporations, banks such as ourselves, to collaborate. Um, we, we, we spoke to the government, the Ministry of Innovation, and again, for a country that is very involved in innovation, we have a ministry called Innovation, so it's, it's very much in the mindset. So we, uh, together with the government, 
uh, committed to, um, to develop for ourselves initially our own fintech capabilities, but also to look to uh, develop the market. Um, we started in 2011. Uh, we, we, I remember when we, we set the, the business up in our offices. I'm from the banking side. We now have two separate offices. And uh, very quickly, we set up a new office um, uh, and we started to develop. I'm going to choose a quick analogy. My wife or my kids will probably laugh at me, but when you're in the kitchen, you want to make a new cake. You know, you know you need some basic ingredients, but you're not sure exactly which ingredients uh, you may need to add to it. And we, we sort of found that we started to develop the ideas, and in time, uh, with collaboration with the government, uh, collaboration with, uh, with the private sector, here with many entities around Israel and from abroad, we managed to develop something which has really um, grown over years. I mean, you know, we all know that technology uh, grows exponentially. So, so seven years, uh, seven years ago, or six, seven years ago, we started a small team. We now have 200 people in our innovation center, um, uh, developing ideas across the board of the banking world. What is interesting, though, is we, we felt at the beginning we were looking to employ uh, the staff, the, 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 the high-level staff we wanted in order to achieve our, 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 our objectives. Our objectives were City is a technology, um, our CEO has often said, we are a technology company with a banking license. Um, so, so we found it hard to actually employ the right people. Uh, so through collaboration, we actually went out to the market and we, we decided we need to really educate the market. We're not saying the market is not educated. What we were saying was the Israeli entrepreneur, the high tech person, is very inquisitive. Uh, he's very, very involved, takes risks. Uh, you know, we have these people, I know a lot of my friends are these sort of uh, startup uh, junkies. They move from one to the next. We felt the fintech area, which is where we wanted to, to, to find solutions for our own use, uh, was not so well developed. So we went out and actually educated. Uh, we brought people in. We, 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 we met people. It's called meetups. You know, um, perhaps, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from London originally. You know, this language, this new language sometimes gets me. But, but uh, so we have these meetups and we have, uh, we, we, we reach out through social media and, uh, and slowly we've developed the market. Uh, so now we also, uh, as a result of that, we also developed an accelerator unit. So we're proud to say we, we, we are the first fintech accelerator in Israel, and in fact, the first fintech accelerator for City globally. Um, now we've gone through six waves of an accelerator unit. We have 200 companies have gone through us. They've raised $275 million in, in right. funding, for, which is very good for, for companies at that stage. Uh, the fintech industry in Israel uh, accounts for something like 600 companies. Um, many of them are successful, um, and, and I believe we've been very much an agent for change for that. Uh, and the key for that was a collaboration together with the governments of Israel with other people. Uh, and and uh, we've been very proud of that. That, that. So too is with our financial inclusion, where we're very much um, many people knocking our doors and saying, City, you're a global bank. You're leading in community development. Um, help us. We're, we're struggling to develop solutions. And over time, with Glenn and his team at the Milken, we've been able to, to create that change. But it's still very much, I think, what we call a collaboration. Uh, and I think the last word meaning uh, for all of us is important is action. Because in the end of the day, um, we all want to get past the finishing line. And that's often the biggest challenge. Well, let's just do one quick, we're going to uh, sum up. We, we have a, a private session to continue talking about the California MOU with Professor David Zilberman uh, from Berkeley and Senator Hertzberg and some other folks. But just very quickly, anything that we missed or one last comment? Just uh, uh, So last comment I'll make and I literally the finish line. Angela, your comments were very uh, inspirational when you talked about going from the service provider site to the implementation side of things. In many, many industries, mm -hmm. the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed. Mm -hmm. And I had a business school professor. I didn't go to Berkeley, but I had a business school professor who said that great ideas are a dime a dozen. It's all about implementation. Implementation, like Jeremy said, it's about innovation centers. It's about people. So I think I just want to thank you, uh, Glenn, because the uh, Milken Innovation Center and the Jerusalem Institute of Fellows in uh, in Jerusalem really helping uh, the government to help uh, bring this change that we're all talking about. At the end of the day, we need to be focused on implementation, mm -hmm. and the implementation is best served by motivated individuals. And given that the Milken Center is providing us with so many of these individuals, I just want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you, thank you. Karen? <laughs>
Um, I, I was struck by how important it is, no matter what the goals are here, that connection at the local level and really understanding what it is to walk in their shoes and to know the problem from where they are and working with them and a partnership and a true collaboration so that it will work for them. That's the fast way to make that innovation spread. Angela? Um, what I would say is we have all the pieces of the puzzle in the room. Like everybody is here and that thanks to the convening power that you're putting together and Milken with the institute and that's fantastic. Now it's just about like, let's get it done. <laughs> Richard, any last challenge to us? Well, I would want to thank you, Glenn, and the Milken Institute and that we now can take what wasn't particularly going anywhere and broaden the connection between the University of California and, um, and, and the state of Israel. I think there's a lot of ways to go, and I want to get there by way of Rwanda. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's, those are the and, dots we're trying to get. And I, my final comment that I always make is, despite all you want to talk about in terms of technology, don't forget to walk the villages. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for your leadership with the Blum Centers and deploying all that human capital uh, for us here, too. Uh, so I very much talked about uh, partnerships within Rwanda, uh, but I think with the work that we started to talk about with you, Glenn, uh, the Milken Institute, and working with the Israeli institutions that have had, have had a lot of experience uh, looking at partnerships even outside Rwanda, I think is very crucial. And I think that always requires champions. Uh, for things to get done, there's got to be a champion. And uh, I count on you to continue to be that champion. Thank you. And well, I Jeremy. think the, the conference, the beauty of perhaps being one of the last sessions is that you've for three days been listening and taking it in. And I think, you know, one of the themes of the conference, as we know, is uh, creating a meaningful life. Yep. You know, so we're all sitting talking here and all of us have the ability to do something about that. Uh, we've already got a number of takeaways um, from the conference. Um, today we've discussed a number of issues. Um, and I think we all need to basically take that and basically all of us in the room, uh, we, we all have the ability to do what we call pay forward. You know, and that's, and that's I think, something we should be, uh, be taking away. And we should all get this across the finishing line, because I think that's one of the biggest challenges is that today is we can all talk, we can all theorize, we can all write reports, and we can all bring forward ideas. But that challenge is, is getting it moving towards the point of action. It, it is like that line in that song, and I'll just close with that, about that uh, the future started yesterday and we're already late. So, <laughs> thank you all for being here.